TCI is brought to you by Race Day, the fastest winner of the Grade 2 Oaklawn Handicap since Medallia Doro. The talented son of Tappet is new to Spendthrift for 2016. Welcome back to TCI, your inside track to the Breeders' Cup. Alongside Joel Cunningham, I'm John Siegel. Well, Joel, today we're going to release three new TCI top fives for this year's Breeders' Cup. We're going to talk about the Philly and Mare Sprint. Last week, we released the Sprint, which unfortunately will have some changes. You know, we, we lost Rockfall. It was an unfortunate situation there at, at Keeneland. So we'll have to make some adjustments to the, the Breeders' Cup Sprint. But today we're going to talk about the Phillies. Let's talk about the Philly and Mare Sprint. You know, this is pretty interesting when I look on this list. The first horse that jumps off to me is Super Majesty. Very talented horse. And why she jumps off to me is she wasn't even really pointed towards this race. It's pretty interesting they're going to run her in here. Well, I think, John, personally, this is one of the most wide open divisions uh, that we're going to see this year in the Breeders' Cup. I mean, they're, you don't have that, you know, groupie doll, that top heavy, you know, home run hitting type horse like Groupie Doll or even Judy the Beauty who might probably going to run in this race. Her form is nothing like it's been the prior two years to where you would say, okay, she could be a standout in here, particularly as much as she likes Keeneland. So I find it to be a very wide open group with some good emerging up and coming three-year-olds as well as some established older mares. But you know, at seven-eighths distance and the amount of speed that's signed on for this race really makes it a wide open group. Super Majesty, I mean, you mentioned her. She was going to run the Raven Run Stakes at Keeneland this weekend, but she worked so well over the track that they said, you know what, we're going to take a shot at the big race. You know, hold off for a few weeks, take a shot against older mares. You know, she's affiliate personally. I would have liked to have seen earlier this year at Saratoga where I think she could have been a grade one type filly, and they played it slow. They tried to stretch her out around two turns. She is by Super Saver. But ever since she's been back around one turn, she's undefeated around one turn, John. If you go yeah. back and look at that allowance win and her maiden win in California, uh, just dominant performances. She ran fast, looked good doing it. And then she went to Churchill, you know, last time out in the Dogwood, set a pretty good pace. You know, closers made a run at her in that race, but she was just much the best all alone at the wire. And I just had that feeling that she's that up and coming. I mean, I almost had her at number one in here. Wow. I thought about it very closely just because, again, I'm thinking out of the box in this division. I think it's a wide open group. And when I look at the pace in this race, John, I think it's going to be a, a torrid pace. I mean, you have horses that are just crack sprinters, live or died. Good six, six and a half furlong sprinter has one way to go to the lead. Stone Tastic's another one. I mean, I think right now, if you had asked me who the best Philly Mare sprinter in the country is, I'd say it's Stone Tastic. This filly here, John, her win last time out against Allowance Company was just an awesome performance. Got a 109 buyer in there. The filly, it was way back, you know, 15 lengths back or whatever, came back and won at Keeneland the other day. I just don't know if Stone Tastic's going to want to like seven furlongs. I mean, she might be more of a six, six and a half furlong horse that has to have it in her own way, but she's going to have to fight Terrace on the lead. She's going to have to fight, you know, Lobber Dodd, who definitely is very quick. So again, I, Pace is going to make this race like it does every race, but to me, this is such a good group of fillies and mares, both young and old, to me, that it's a wide open division, and that's kind of why I had a hard time putting the top five <laughs> together in terms of the order, and that's why I came with it. Artemis Agriterra hasn't even run this year. She's working well, but she hasn't even run this year, but I think it's seven eights. She, deser she deserves to be on the top five as an older mare and a grade one winner. Terrace, affiliate loves Keeneland, had a wide trip in the L.A. Woman last time out. I think she can run better than that, John, but, you know, again, her form hasn't been as good. And Cavorting's a three-year-old filly. They've spotted her campaign out very well. I'm not so sure if she's as good as some of these other ones, but to me, she deserves to be in there, too. So it's a wide-open group this year. It's wide open, but there's just a lot of class this year. I mean, really, the Breeders' Cup, we really got some good horses. You know, you got good older horses, you got good three-year-olds, we got good two-year-olds, and let's talk about yep. some of that. Let's go ahead and release the juvenile fillies. You know, looking in here, Joel, I see horses Songbird, horses... You know, I think a much deserved number one in there. Rachel's Valentina. I mean, Land Over Sea. I mean, look at these horses. We got some really good two year olds running this year. The two year old Phillies are really good. You know, the two year old Colts, you know, you could argue that there's no real standout in that division. But for me, St Songbird, you know, off of that performance in the Chandelier, I feel that was the best prep race. Her campaign in California, John, and you look at that pedigree and how well she ran around two turns. To me, she's head and shoulders right now above the two year old Phillies. And, I mean, that's saying something because Rachel's Valentina, I mean, look at the hype that's followed her, a yeah. grade one winner. The thing I don't like about Rachel's Valentina as much, Sean, is that, you know, she's a liner made filly. They decided to skip the frisette. I didn't think that was a characteristic move from, you know, that you see out of Todd Pletcher and Train right up to this race. So a little concern about Rachel's Valentina, you know, in terms of uh, if she's quite as good as Somberg right now. But 
definitely deserving of the number two spot. And I even think, you know, you look at the Doug, Doug O'Neill Phillies at three and four, land over sea, ran a good runner-up performance, you know, the two-term Philly, was a very good runner-up in the chandelier, in my opinion. Should like maybe a more fair surface at Keeneland where she can, you know, launch that bid from off the pace, and maybe there's going to be other pace presence to go with Songbird here yep. to soften her up. So Land Over Sea, I think, is a live outsider. And from what I hear from that O'Neill barn, they've liked Land Over Sea better than Gomo. Wow. Gomo's a grade one winner at Keeneland, obviously won the Alcibiades very impressively. And then the Tap at Philly, Tap to it, very competitive uh, over there in New York uh, with Rachel's Valentina. A lot of pedigree there. They've also elected to train her up to this. So to me, that's five good fillies right there, John, but I definitely think Songbird is a deserving number one. All right, well, let's talk a little bit about the juvenile Colts then. <clears throat> you know, it's interesting when I look at your list here, you see Nyquist in at number five. I mean, this horse has already won two grade ones this year and you got him in at number five. Uh, he's in number five because I don't think he's a two-turn horse. I mean, you know, I look at his pedigree, and certainly there's some two-turn influences there, but to me, I think he's much more brilliant around one turn. I think you see that in his form. You know, his last time out in the forerunner wasn't near as good of a performance as Songbird's effort in the chandelier that same day at the same distance for the Phillies. So, to me, I really question his ability to now travel, face top Colts around two turns. I think he definitely belongs in the top five, but... Uh, the other horse I have above him, I think maybe have a little better shot. You know, Greenpoint Crusader, I could say the same about him. Impressive last time out in the Champagne, you know, it was uh, off surface that day. But everything out of that mare, I mean, that's like a, that mare's produced the who's who's of horses the last few years. I mean, I can think of Justin Phillip, I can think of Algorithms. I mean, there's been a lot of good horses that uh, have been out of the mare that Greenpoint Crusader is out of. But they're all one-turn horses. Yeah. You know, everybody wants to say, well, Crypto Clearance Mare, they're going to stretch out. They've all been more brilliant one-turn horses. So Greenpoint Crusader, to me, has to he has to prove that he can stretch out around two turns and be as effective. That's the reason that he's not in the top three. I do think Stick Stately Dude is a dangerous horse. I think he's better than his fourth-place performance, where he's kind of even last time out uh, in the Breeders' Futurity to where, you know, I think he needed that race. You know, he got a little sick before the hopeful. They had to skip that and train up to this race. Brody's cause obviously won the Breeders' Futurity. He's probably going to be your favorite now, John, off the fact that he's got back-to-back -back wins, very impressive off-the-pace performance. But he's another horse that launches from way back. So to me, he needs sort of a setup. And when he won the Breeders' Futurity, you see him covered in mud here, it was a typey track. It was a muddy type surface. So, you know, he's definitely not ascension here. That's why I have Exaggerator, number one. To me, he's just had the most complete campaign from coast to coast. You know, certainly a pedigree that two turns shouldn't be an issue. I thought he ran pretty well last time out. May have even needed, you know, coming off a small layoff, layoff may have needed that race in the in the Breeders' Futurity when he was second in there to Brody's cause. So I, I clearly think that that local prep race around two turns is going to be the race that, if you look at my top three, that your Breeders' Cup Juvenile winner should come out of this you year. You know, we've been doing this show long enough. I'm going to put you on the spot here. Do you remember with Uncle Mo when he was running in here? I can't remember if you said that you were worried about his pedigree or not, that, that he would be a two-turn horse. I can't remember if you thought Uncle Mo would, would win the Breeders' Cup Juvenile. You, you know, Uncle Mo was having an arch mare, and he was so superior to his rivals. You know, I mean, I, I remember even the boys at Toscanova was getting a lot of hype then from the Dick Dutro barn and, and did run second in there. But Uncle Mo was so superior over his rivals. I can't recall. I, I want to say I bet somebody else that day, John. But I certainly didn't leave Uncle Mo off any tickets because he was so superior to his rivals in that crop. I don't see that colt this year. I don't see, I, I, I can't certainly put Nyquist in that, that spot. I can't say Brody's cause is in that spot yet. So to me, it's a fairly wide open group. So I think the Juvenile will be a good race and it'll be a tactical race. All right, thank you, Joel. And yep. thank you guys for watching. Make sure you come back next week. We'll have a few more TCI top fives for you.